Why has this planned constitutional change sparked so much protest in mm. Japan? I think this is very important because, first of all, it's a challenge in the eyes of many people that it's going to transform permanently Japan's post-war pacifist policy. Uh, if you know the details of Article 9 in the Japanese constitution that was um, passed in 1947 through the Japanese Diet back then, it was, you know, post-war reconstruction of Japan, just like in Germany and Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, Article 9 states that the Japanese people forever forfeit the right for casus belli, which is the Latin for the right to wage war. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a very unfortunate, you know, and unpleasant, you know, uh, issue, but sovereign countries do have the right to declare war and to wage war and therefore to make decisions on their military uh, strategy in as much as they can independently. But of course, this is post-war global world, Cold War. Uh, Germany, Japan were reconstructed according to the Allied vision and the U.S. vision of, you know, how they should be incorporated into the Western, you know, uh, alliance and the Western, you know, democratic uh, environment. So for the public, this is the first time there's a challenge to that pacifist principle. It may have been an occupation, you know, constitution, but still, the Japanese public did accept it. They accepted it because they didn't want militarism, they didn't want ultranationalism, they didn't want, you know, the dangers of imperialism like in the 1930s and 40s, and they had suffered greatly. Millions of people had died, two atomic bombs, reconstructing the economy like, you know, the phoenix, you know, rising from ashes, you know, all over again. And so for the public, look, I looked at the statistics yesterday, even today, which is not, you know, Japan's population is a very well-off population. It's a very developed population, very middle class, very, you know, non-political, you know, kind of going about their own business, you know, typical 21st century urban, you know, developed economy, post-industrial society. And 55% of the public are dead set against this revision. 55% of the public. And this so is, is it really, unusual that means, for the Japanese yes, people for to, them, uh, to be so like, active in, yes, in voicing yes. their opposition? This is the first time I tell you, you know, I lived in Japan back in the years of the early reconstruction of Japan. This was early 1960s. And the Japanese public back then had just barely emerged from, you know, the occupation. They were finding out their ways again to be independent in as much as they could under the U.S. security, you know, alliance. But the public was also very politicized. That was the 60s. And there were huge demonstrations in Tokyo and in the big cities against, you know, the U.S.-Japanese, you know, security alliance, against this, that, Vietnam War, and so on. But all of that died out at the end of the 70s. The Japanese public, just like maybe, you know, public everywhere, you know. So what's behind Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's okay, push problem, to change the Japanese fabric? My interpretation, okay? I think that um, Prime Minister Abe, first of all, the understandable part of his concern and his push for all of this is that there is really, especially within the political decision makers in Japan, a concern about China. That China's rise is also not just economic, but it's becoming military. And it could be China is speaking in a more aggressive fashion, if you've noted lately, you know. And so they're really concerned about that. And they feel like they should be militarily well prepared. This is understandable, okay? Whether that should lead to a constitutional, you know, reinterpretation, that's another point. Second, I think that Prime Minister Abe is under the, if you will, constant, you know, uh, desire of the United States to rearm Japan. Because the United States, I believe, wants Japan to be a very strong supporter of its own global military, if you will, presence in East Asia. And so, uh, the, some, you know, high up, you know, officials from the United States are supporting this revision. So it's a U.S. kind of, you know, if you will, strategic need. And obviously the Prime Minister of Japan does have to respond to that. But the problem with this revision and the outcry is not just the loss of a, you know, pacifistic, you know, principle, but it's also, it is truly a concern for especially the uh, experts on constitutional law and legal opinion that the due process of law that's being followed is very questionable. Why? Because there's an amendment, you know, article in the Constitution. It's a very nice article. The Japanese Constitution, like all written constitutions, has a nice, you know, article which defines exactly how a government should amend the Constitution. Two-thirds of the votes in the upper and lower houses plus a national referendum. 
Prime Minister Abe probably suspects that he's not going to be able to succeed in a referendum if 55% of the national public opinion against today it. is against it. So he's avoiding that constitutional procedure to amend the constitution. That's also part of the This is protest. also the concern of a lot of, you know, uh, law experts, constitutional experts. They're really concerned about that because, look, you can reinterpret the constitution about Article 9. How about, you know, then it opens the way for reinterpreting all of the other articles. There's nothing to stop you. Okay, yeah. And it's not legal. Not legal in the constitutional sense. This is the concern of the Japanese public. Let's talk about the disadvantages and disadvantages of a law allowing Japan uh, pursuing this militaristic... Um... Advantage. If you speak totally in realpolitik terms and economic terms, this will probably allow the government to invest more in a military economy in a military industrial production. In other words, you know, Japan is a very high technology society. It has really state-of-the-art technology in every field. And therefore, Japan has the potential for uh, the manufacture of very sophisticated military armament. It's a way to kickstart the economy, because as you know, the economy has been stagnating for the last 20 years. Two decades. So, Maybe, maybe, from an economic perspective, it would be an advantage. But also, it may advantage. have benefited uh, by not being able to do this in the past. By Exactly, because uh, all of the resources of Japan's economy and its productivity poured into the civilian economy. So people benefited from that. People became a very prosperous middle-class society. And Japanese people's income, you know, rose up to such levels that it's on par with, you know, Western Europe and United States right now. And this is the first time ever in the history of humanity that a non-European nation has the per capita income on par with the most developed, you know, and prosperous economies of the world. So this is, this is like a historic, you know, turning point. Okay. And they don't want to lose that. They don't right. want to lose that potential.